Hi, welcome back to the Trial by Jennifer podcast. I am your host, Jennifer Butterfield, and today I have a mentor and former professor of mine, um, also the former VP of HR at Cisco Technologies, uh, Jeffrey Quaid. And I'd like to introduce you. Uh, Jeff, feel free to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, sure. So, uh, Jennifer, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have had a very fortunate career. I um, was trained as an industrial psychologist. I chose to go into human resources way back in the day and uh, worked my way through each of the chairs, compensation, benefits, recruiting, etc. And I've been able to span everything from working with two startups, ground up, to working with a couple of Fortune 100s. Uh, so that spanned about 27 years. And as I was looking to exit that, by the grace of God or fate or whatever, I got a call from St. Edwards University to think about a professorial role. And I've just had a ball with that for the last, oh my gosh, uh, five years almost. So um, just enjoying a great set of students in a, um, in a university that really cares about uh, teaching and learning. Very different than the ones I went to, which were huge and basically more in the research. St. Edwards, and I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a spot for them here, but it really <laughs> does put a lot of emphasis on the student experience, the achievement of learning, and um, that's just something that always um, was always huge for me. So I've got kind of a second career going, a second shot, and uh, have had the opportunity to work with a number of just outstanding students, you being one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in my time at St. Edwards and uh, still doing some consulting on the side for a few friends I have in industry and uh, keeps me busy. Wonderful. Yeah, I um, for those of you listening, I, I have the opportunity to take uh, Jeff's organizational behavior course and HR management during my undergraduate studies at St. Edwards University. And um, I was getting a degree in bachelor, a bachelor's in business administration, and um, I loved it so much. I decided to come back for a master's degree, which I start next week. And so, we wanted to be sure to get our episode recorded and, and aired before the school year started. And I'm just so excited and thrilled to have you on on the podcast. And I asked this to each of my guests. Um, since it is personal finance related, I'm always curious about what the conversation was like in your home growing up around personal finance. And I know that you have um, grown kids as well. And so I'm curious, like on both sides of um, growing up and then also raising kids, what was personal finance like uh, and talking about money growing up and um, through adulthood? Right. So. Um... I, I guess it would fit probably the pattern of most first-generation college grads because I was. I was the first one to go to college and get a degree in the Quaid family. And um, when I was growing up, it, my parents were very much, you know, Depression-era uh, children. So it was bank your money, put it away, be fastidious with it, be careful with it, and uh, be planful with it. And that was just something that was really ingrained in my brother and I as we were growing up, whether it was our paper route money or that first job um, I had when you know, you're know you getting out in the world and starting to do things. But it was always be mindful of it, be careful with it. And then when you decided to put it somewhere, really do your research. Understand, you know, Dad had us reading about the banks. He had us reading about wherever we put our $20 a week. Um, just to be mindful of, of where it was and what we were doing, and that always stuck with me. So, um, being a boomer, you know, our generation was always extremely achievement oriented, and part of that was making money and setting goals for yourself—50,000 a year, 100 a year, whatever—and and reaching those. And um, uh, that old learning stayed with me, where no matter how much I made, it wasn't going to be squandered or, or just spent ludicrously. It was going to be thought about. And so when I got to the point in my career where it became uh, sensical to have a financial advisor, I got one of those right away. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a finance major, I wasn't a finance major, uh, and I wanted to make sure I was working with uh, an organization and a financier who could really look out for me. And so it's always been careful, stepwise, and thoughtful. That doesn't mean I don't have a few things I enjoy, like a 1978 Corvette that I still work on. <laughs> I do. 
but all in the course of, you know, keeping my priorities straight. One was getting married, the second was having two kids, and those things oversee everything in terms of where the money should go. But you've got to take time out to, to live, too, and enjoy. And I've been fortunate with the jobs I've had, the travel and pleasure travel, and um, getting around the world has been a, a, a great education. So, uh, in a nutshell, keeping it close, being careful with it, and making sure my priorities were straight about where the money went. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of uh, the theme of research, doing your research, doing your homework on where the money's going and what the market looks like and staying on top of it in terms of um, maintaining a close pulse with it. Um, yeah, I so it, in terms of like who has been an influential source around money, I know you mentioned your father, but have there been any, um, you know, uh, educators or authors or anyone who has been an influential source around um, how you uh, move in the world um, financially? Yeah, I think most of that happened in industry for me. Mm -hmm. With having, you know, if you're, you're lucky if you get two or three really great managers in your career, at least I think so. Mm -hmm. And one of them was a CEO that I worked for uh, when we were living in North Carolina and uh, really taught me uh, business per se rather than just HR so what's a P&L how does it operate what's above the line what's below the line all that and that made a big impact in my personal view to my finances I mean my revenue line was my salary and whatever else was coming in and then I really thought of where my money went very much in keeping with a profit and loss statement and so I was looking at you know revenue recurring costs working myself down to the incidentals like taxes and such and that viewpoint of taking the macro of a business and applying it to personal finances worked out pretty well because um, you have to keep a line on everything. So I ran personals like we did the companies. We did monthlies, we did quarterlies, and I did the same for myself and my family. I was also fortunate enough to marry an MBA. So, you know, in terms of exactly where all the money is, she probably knows better than I do. <laughs> but, uh, in the course of that, um, applying business to personal made a big difference for me. And I had a CEO that really took the time, kind of before the mid part of my career, to uh, school me on that. And it made a big difference. That's amazing. Um, yeah, I feel like uh, that question comes up a lot in these conversations that I'm having with people. And I'm noticing, you know, I. I Oftentimes, we'll anticipate someone saying, "Oh, Tony Robbins, or you know, whoever," and it's it's usually the people that are closest to the individual that um, you know are able to develop like a mentorship relationship or just um, have had that level of influence. So I always find that really interesting. And um, yeah, I wanna I wanna draw. There's so much of your expertise. I wish we. Had the opportunity to cover it over like five episodes. I mean, I, I took two of your courses over the course of the semester, and so um, it's hard to condense all of the wisdom um, you've bestowed on me in one podcast episode. But let's get into. I've got a lot of um, audience members who are, you know, in the zillennial generation, if you will, uh, Generation Z and millennials, and um, you know, the, the job market is. Uh, yeah, what, tell me a little bit, what's your, what's your take on the current job market? I know you've seen many job markets, and so I'm curious about um, what your analysis or perspective is on where we stand today. Yeah, sure, absolutely. First of all, let me say that a lot of this generational stuff going back and forth, me personally, I love millennials and Gen Zs. They push the limits, they ask you the hard questions, they make you rethink things, which I think is cool. And that way, what goes on in my classrooms is learning on both sides all the time. You know, I've got all this stuff I've done, which I share, and they've got all these questions about how to make it relevant. And that's cool. And it, and it just works out. I think that, you know, the question begs two issues. One is what's new and different because of the current generations that are working in the marketplace. Right now, most of your senior leaders are what are called Gen Xers, the ones that followed us. Most of us are moving on to other things. Um, and so you've got that in the marketplace, you've got millennials, you've got Zs, and you've got that next crop coming up behind the Zs already. So there's a constant push behind every generation. So the biggest changes that I see that have occurred, some things are enduring, and I'll get to that in a second, but the big changes have been the use of technology, obviously. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, Zoom meetings, podcasts, um, cell phones on the veranda, all those kind of things that weren't done prior have changed the complexion somewhat. I think that the overall style of the newer generations is to be more direct, at the same time being more casual, which is kind of an interesting mix than what mm -hmm. we came up in, which was more formal, more structured. And so uh, I think there's an openness to, you know, uh, dressing more casually, appearing more casually, conducting interviews more casually, which I think can be really cool because you can get to know the real person without, you know, is their tie on straight. Um, I think that's beneficial. So I think those are a lot of great changes. I think the tech can be really powerful. However, like with all tools, like we're all worried about AI now, like with all tools, um, they're just tools and, and they have to be used smartly and adroitly. So hiring managers that are, are not comfortable conducting an interview who don't like to get face to face may lean too hard on tech and not really get to know well enough who they're bringing in. Mm -hmm. And so I think what you find in most instances, or I do when I talk to people at all levels of hiring from executive to first line, is there's still a need to connect personally, to, to feel like you are, are connecting with the person that you're interviewing with and I still believe that happens best in person. So I think most folks should feel or realize that I think it, somewhere in their hiring process they're going to have a, a, an in-person meeting. Might be at a coffee shop, might be in a brick and mortar facility, might be at an airport, but most managers still like to have some type of, of connection there. Uh, and so I think that's uh, I think that's one of the pieces that's going to be enduring. There's got to be some kind of connection. And I think most job searchers um, like to feel before they say yes that this could be a person they'd like to work with. So I have some enduring and some change. Yeah, the chemistry is important. I um, I find that fascinating. And I know there are so I just I'm in the middle of releasing. Um, I just released part seven of this 12 part YouTube series on landing a higher paying job and um, mm. a lot of the uh, soft skills, negotiation tactics, things like that um, are equipping candidates to maybe make a leap. Um, you know, lateral moves have become um, very predominant in the recent years, especially with COVID. And, um, you know, I, I've heard you talk about the buckets. So say somebody, can you walk me through um, the process? Say somebody is in a position or maybe currently unemployed and looking for a role, let's talk a little bit about um, uh, just their, wh what steps can they take? What are some things they can be thinking about um, from start to finish? And so um, throughout that whole process, since you have that internal um, expertise. Yeah, sure. Well, I think that one mistake a lot of job searchers uh, fall into is being passive searchers is what I call it. What's on the web? What's on Glassdoor? What does ZipRecruiter have? And those are all ads that are out and running and everybody's seeing them. So the competition for them is always going to be higher. And especially if you're looking to make a move up because just reading a posting doesn't tell you enough about what that move up would look like. So um, that's great, but it's passive. I think you've got to be assertive, if not aggressive, when you're going to jump into the market. And to your question on a move up, I think it's important that people do their homework. Uh, within their own organization that they're in, what does one up look like or two up look like? And if that's in the management, it can be a big change. It can be a huge change from being an individual contributor to having to worry and work with people. Uh, my father was a great engineer, and God bless him, he never managed people because he never should have. Never, never, never. But he had a great career as an engineer and did very, very well, and that was his domain. So when it comes to the buckets, I think the first thing that a lot of job searchers don't do is they don't do enough research. So yes, all those job boards are out there, and, and I named a few of them that are quite good, actually, because Glassdoor does give you some uh, company background. But they need to do more research, and they need to sit first and think about what they want. What do they really want? What sector? What type of industry? Uh, how big of a company? What city it's in? All those things are very important now because, as we know, Austin has one type of culture and Dallas is different, being in Texas. So knowing where you want to live while you work, I think, is important to overall satisfaction on the job. You'd like to spend your weekends enjoying Austin if you're into Austin, but if you're into New York, you're not going to find it in Austin, those kind of things. 
But then the company research, back to that. What do you really want to work in? How large a company? What type of career path do you have? Just giving some thought, sitting down with a coffee cup or a glass of wine and, and thinking that through before you try to penetrate the market. Because everything looks great if you don't know what you're looking for. And so my first thought is do the research, find the companies that fit that profile that you want and then go after them, don't wait for them. Find out who the CEO is. Most of the stuff is public, even for venture cap firms. The information's gotta be out there. Find out who's hiring. Don't go to HR, don't go. My job was to screen you out, not screen you in. And so if you know that you wanna go in the marketing, find the VP of HR of marketing and go after her and, and talk and call and email and pester her until she really believes you're, you're, you're really you know, hot on joining that company, mm -hmm. get your airtime. Don't wait, but do your research first, then go after them directly. Remember, the worst thing they can say to you is no thanks, which is what you've got right now. So why not? Uh, I also talk uh, and have coached to job searchers on, look, if you're really high on working for Amazon, and the first time they tell you no, that's fine for about a month. Then go back again. Make them say no again. It isn't. They're not going to get upset with you as much as they're going to be impressed with you. That this is something you obviously want or you wouldn't be coming back the fourth time. So that, that's the research part. That's the first bucket. And it's really important because it's where you're going to end up with all the other skills, whatever they are. Interviewing skills, negotiation skills, onboarding skills, all the rest of it. So the first bucket, you know, Jennifer, I would say is doing your homework, understanding where you want to go. Yes, use the passives, use the job boards, but go after them. Because the higher up you go, here's the other rule of thumb, in a company or in levels, the less that they're posted. They're, right. People network for jobs at a director and VP level and a CEO level. I know all the C-suite, we never posted those jobs. It was who do you know, how do you get there? And so you've got to penetrate that level if you want to get there. You, you, you can't wait because it won't come. Not at those levels. Right. Okay, so we, we've narrowed it down. We've gotten our foot in the door and we're preparing for an interview. Um, walk a candidate through. Um, obviously, we've done our homework, right? We know where we want to work. But what are some soft skills and different... Um, elements that you found to be impressive that you would coach um, a candidate on in terms of making an impression and, and ultimately landing the job. Right. right. Well, it goes without saying that the resume was an important piece in this. It's still used and mm -hmm. they still prefer chronological resumes. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, but I know people make a lot of money putting pictures on them and making them look very, very creative. If you're going for a creative job, yes. If you're going for, a, you know, video graphics or uh, you're going for an artistic job or you're going for something that, create, that requires a great, like a writing position in some cases, yes. But for anything else, it's chronological, it's still things. Uh, in terms of um, some of the skills and, and, and what we're looking for is um, how you show up. So do your homework. How do they dress there? Even for a video. You know, yes, you can have your pajama bottoms on, but the top ought to fit with the company that you're looking to right. to get in with. And some of them might be more buttoned up, like financial firms or mm -hmm. uh, law firms, organizations such as that, where that profet or healthcare, where that professional presence is everything. Others, and in probably most companies right now, it's a bit more casual. But know how they look before you show up in any way. You want mm -hmm. to look like them. And if you don't want to look like them, then don't go after that company because how they look is a very big part of who they are. Hmm. That would be number one. Make sure you look like the person. Secondly, um, when you show up, make sure that you've done your homework on the position in the company. You don't want that interviewer at the end of their questions to say, well, Jennifer, you know, do you have any questions? And she doesn't. She doesn't have anything to say. She didn't do her homework. She doesn't know they had a great quarter, or she doesn't know whether or not they've expanded the company, or they just acquired someplace. Um, you need that in your background so that you can at least ask a couple of questions. One ought to be about the company in general, how it's doing, showing your knowledge that they had a great quarter and that they've just you know expanded into Europe or whatever. The second question ought to get into the position specific and make sure that you're able to show expertise at the company level, in other words, why you're interested in them, and then at the position level about why you're great for this job. 
And so those questions at the end often still left out. I, I find even by mid-management people who don't have a question or two ready to go. And that's, that, can, that can put you ahead of the, of the race. Mm -hmm. Always, always, always take the opportunity to ask the question. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, okay, so now we've got the offer. Um, let's talk a little bit about negotiation strategies and tactics. Uh, I think this is probably the most uh, intimidating part, I think, I, because there is so much emotion that's wrapped up with money and personal finance and income and um, self-worth and all of those things, especially when you're taking the leap, you know, into a, a you know, the most high paying job that you've ever had or, you know, a more senior level um, in, in the role you're looking to fill. And so, um, and I want to tag on to the end of it, you know, a certain scenario, like specifically, um, you know, maybe like a young woman graduating from college at 22, like how, how do we, um, I say we being like, I know women are less likely to uh, negotiate for a higher salary. They're more likely to accept a lower offer than their male counterparts. And I just think about, um, you know, some of the women I was in your class with um, who are going to be you know, graduating at 22 years old, and I can't even imagine what that would be like to be sitting maybe like at an interview panel of male executives in their 40s that are, um, you know, asking her what her ideal salary is and how does she bargain for herself? How does she get what she's wanting? And so, yeah, I, let's open that door to negotiation strategies and, and um, speaking specifically uh, to women and, and um, young folks. Uh, sure. like your college graduates. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, again, you know, I keep going back to this and it's not because I'm a professor. Uh, in my <laughs> career as an executive, uh, you got to do your homework. So if you're looking for a director of marketing job in a Fortune 500 company, uh, or you're looking for an entry level position into a marketing organization in a Fortune 100 or a startup, do your homework. What do those jobs typically get paid? There's plenty of information out there right now. You can go to salary.com and a bunch of other places and see what the bandwidth is, uh, what the offer probably should be. Especially if you're coming right out of college, you probably don't have a position to base it on. So you're not saying, well, I'm currently making 48, I'd like to right. make 62. Right. So you're going really into it um, uh, without a lot of preparation. Again, get out there and see what, what they're paying. Glassdoor will tell you what they're paying. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of sites where you can get a rough feel for the type of role and the kind of company that you're looking to get into. That's job one. Um, job two, as you get into uh, actually having to negotiate, you've come through the interviews, you've got a feel for the company, you think you know how they're gonna operate, you need to phrase your questions in the way that it's gonna resonate for them, right? So if this is a company that's broad brushed and getting into lots of details on the negotiation to start with for the salary is probably not what you want to do. But you, you want to make sure that you're able to take a look at the offer. Now, what I do find is some folks just overly fixate on the salary. They're just looking at the number, whether it's dollars per hour or you know X amount of dough per year. And money's only one component. You've got to look at the entire offer. And I think a lot of people make mistakes with that, where, oh my gosh, it's $75,000 a year, I'll take it. But when they get in and they find out that the health care plan is so ridiculous that they're going to pour a third of that into just making sure they have health care coverage, which we all need, uh, or they just don't offer much in their 401k, or they don't have an HSA, or they just don't have a lot of the other things that can bolster, really bolster, an overall offer, that can be a mistake. So I urge especially college graduates who are looking to get out, talk to folks who are in industry, folks like me, folks that are available, who are able to help them with what the whole offer should look like, all of it, and then place that salary within the realm of the entire offer, not just go after the money, because I've just seen so many folks make mistakes on that. Not that you don't chase, you've got to have a salary you can live on or one you think you're right. worth, right? right? But look at the entire offer before you even start to negotiate and then think about where you want to negotiate within the entire offer. You may not go after money. You may try and negotiate something else like 
vacation time or PTO or time with your family, right? Uh, where companies have some room, they really do, even if they say they don't, have some room to add a day or a half day or negotiating how much time from home, how much in the office. Um, there's flex around that kind of stuff out there right now and I think a lot of folks don't look at all those pieces when they decide on, you know, what's going to make them happy. Right, absolutely. And, um, you know, I think too, like if we could kind of break down like what a good benefits package looks like. I mean, I, I know we can get into a lot of detail with each of those things, but also, I mean, like I think there are some college grads out there that like maybe may not even have an idea of like what a 401k is or what an HSA stands for, you know? And so um, if we could just touch a little bit on those things, since you have experience with offering those packages and what are some things that they should be asking or thinking about when it comes to how to kind of balance out, a, you know, a salary with the benefits package? Sure. Sure. Um, I also want to, if we can, I want to make sure to address the, the male-female thing because yeah. it's it's real. Um, and there are many things women can do to, to change that, that playing field. But uh, in terms of benefits packages, sure. Uh, typically companies offer two or three groupings of benefits. One is what they call health, dental, life. It's, it's the keep your body healthy, keep your family healthy package. Of those, it's always health care that's most important to you. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to have an illness or an accident, even folks who are in their early 20s. What happens if you get thrown off your mountain bike and things are never going to be the same? There needs, you need to be thinking about what the company offers within healthcare. That's the predominant one. Dental's dental. Teeth are going to go bad, you're going to get them fixed. But that's not the same as having two broken legs and a bad back. So you've got to take a look at what they offer in healthcare, and that means understanding what a healthcare package is. Right. And we can we can go into that in another podcast because there's many details in there. Right. But what do they offer for healthcare? And if the quick and easy is well, you know, we don't really, but you know, we offer it. Start thinking hard about that offer. Right. And then there's life insurance. There's dental insurance. What they call the Cobra package, and that's another conversation. But that's the first piece to look at, and, and probably the most important, because if you lose your health, your 401k isn't going to make any difference if you can't put money into it. Right. But that's the next thing I would look at, is what do they offer in terms of a way for you to plan for retirement? And maybe if you're 22, you don't think you're going to retire, but I can tell you, I never thought I'd get this old. So that's something you want to take a look at, is what do they offer? In you know, not-for-profits, it's called a 403b. In for-profit companies, it's called a 401k. The government has their own plans at the federal level and at the state level. So it's important to understand what they're going to do. Now, in the private sector, most often they offer a 401k, and the company will put some money in to match what you put in. And that's right. to help you get inspired to put money into the 401k for your benefit, but also for theirs. Again, another topic. Mm -hmm. But you want to look at how generous that match is. Right? Most companies will match up to 6% of your salary, depending on how much you put in. But take a look at those details, because remember, if you haven't learned about compounding interest, please read about it, because it is Amen. important when it comes to the 401. So that's an important piece. Then you've got uh, what I call excited or exaggerated parts of healthcare, like HSA plans, which allow you to put money in, and if you don't use it, use it for retirement, but they're also portable like 401ks are portable, meaning if you leave that employer, take it with you. The money goes with you. And so long as you reinvest it in a like plan, then the federal government isn't going to come after you for taxes. And you've usually got a 60-day window to make that change. So to me, when I look at benefit plans, those are important. Now, one that has become increasingly important is called paid time off, PTO. And typically in that package, many companies will call it PTO, in that package resides your vacation and your sick days. And they're, often they all end up into one pot and use them as you will. Some companies still keep those separate. So take a hard look at what they offer the first year and do those numbers go up with length of service at two years, three years, five years. Um, they're, they're becoming much more competitive. Uh, you used to go in and get two weeks of vacation a year and 10 sick days or five sick days, and those things have become much larger uh, because employees have been, or prospective employees have been pushing harder on wanting mental health time, which God bless them, they should get. 
So that's an important part of the package, and it can be worth a lot more than an extra $3,000 a year. So that's what I mean by taking a look at all the components, what's going to work for you, if you've got a family, what's going to work for the rest of them, if you've got a significant other or a partner, what's going to work for them, and making sure that the whole package is robust enough. And giving up a couple of dollars on the salary to get a couple of these other pieces might well be worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's touch on the um, young women in the job market industry. Yeah. Uh, conversation just because um i've been in some pretty cutthroat job negotiations myself and um it has been uh like getting punched in the stomach at times and i also i like i said i just can't even imagine i mean i'm 32 i'm a non-traditional student so i'm thinking of like where i was when i was 22 and i just um what are what are some things that women can do um to to start off at the same same salary that the men are starting off, you know, because I mean, you, you start off lower, it's hard, pretty hard to catch up throughout the yeah. course of a lifetime. And so yes. let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and that's that never catch up. That's why you're seeing, seeing a number, a growing number of cities or states that are making it illegal to ask people about their prior compensation. Because by, by asking people how much they made at XYZ company, if a woman has always been lagging the market, she will continue to lag the market. Yeah. Um, rather than, uh, because you know, if I can hire, if I'm looking to hire somebody at 65K, but I know from Jennifer's uh, prior compensation levels that she's making 56, why would I offer all the way to 65? I would save my money. And so when people, and it's the same for people of color, anyone who has been endemically paid less um, that process of, of asking you what you currently make is just going to perpetuate that. And so you get businesses saying, yeah, but you know, that's the way it works. I mean, we always try and buy low. Well, if you buy low, you might sometimes get what you get when you buy low. Um, secondly, if a job is worth $65,000, why wouldn't I pay anybody who's capable $65,000? It doesn't matter how they look or which gender they are or any of that. What matters is the quality of the candidate, right? And that goes into how a company does a good job of screening or doesn't. On the female side, on the women's side, especially I think with, with young women coming right out of college, and, and most of them are, some of them are folks that have gone back, so I don't want to leave them out at all, but uh, they've never negotiated at this level before. I mean, it's been 12 bucks an hour to wait on tables, or it's, you know, like we all worked our way through school. Um, and now they're coming out and somebody's saying, well, I'll give you 32.5 for to start this position. And, and she's sitting there going, oh my God, it's more money than I've ever made. True. But is it what the job is worth? And that's where doing the homework is so important. College grads need to go out there and price the positions that they're going to go after so they know if they're being made a fair offer or not. And there's always some bandwidth in an offer. Remember that it's called a pay grade in the company. And they may say, look, the average for this job is 35000 a year, but we pay as low as twenty-seven and as much as forty-two. That's called a pay grade. And they will hire within that bandwidth. They're probably targeting somewhere in there around the midpoint for what they're going to offer. And we should know that going in. So all that homework's important. The thing going against women is the socialization that's gone in that they shouldn't be as aggressive or as assertive as men. And I hate to say it, but it's still out there. And that hurts women in negotiations because they're not willing to get into what I call rough and tumble on the job offer, which can be done very, it's not a personal thing. We're, we're, we're negotiating numbers around a job. It's not two people arguing. And I think there's, there's still some issues with women being comfortable with that. And to that I would say, go practice. Right. Go sit down with a, a friend, usually a male, and get them to negotiate with you face to face and get into it and get tough with it. But again, the prep for that is write down what you want. Write it down. Salary, 401k, health care. Write what you'd like to have. I had one person, and I think, and I've done it since then personally, we got into negotiating, and she just slid this piece of paper across the table. And I said, What's that? She goes, That's what I'd like to have. And it was all in there. Salary, benefits, 401k, days off. And I said, I was impressed. And I said, well, first of all, I'd love to hire you. 
this is great. And you see it happen often at the executive level where they don't want to bat numbers around, they'll just shove a piece of paper over. She had learned that early in her career. Wow. And there it is. We didn't have to go piece by piece by piece. I knew what she was after. I tried to meet everything I could and we ended up hiring her. But I love the approach. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think that's a really great strategy. Um, yeah, that... Yeah, it's a big, big conversation, and I think too, like I've never, I've never even heard of that suggestion even in your classes. So I think that's so helpful, and um, I hope that other other women who are listening to this that are in the job market or soon to be uh, can employ that strategy and find it to be effective. I, I think that um, it definitely uh, does show a level of confidence, um, and then it's right there in writing. Um, great suggestion. Um, okay, so. And this is kind of off script, but I'm curious, um, and I know this has come up um, in, in uh, topics of conversation, but, you know, it, the internal hire versus the, you know, the promotion versus taking the lateral move. And so, you know, say somebody is in a position and they've been there for a while um, and they are wanting to be making more money. You know, they're, they're starting to map out, you know, their earning potential over the course of a working lifetime. And... Um, maybe the company that they're with hasn't been, um, you know, giving them the, the salary increase uh, that they desire. Um, can you talk a little bit about from an internal perspective, um, you know, what a good company or somebody that uh, values their employees, um, what that would look like in terms of promoting internally or um, hiring externally and like, what a what a candidate would do, um, you know, depending on if they were working for a good company, what would that look like? And um, yeah, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, internally, it's often called a job posting system. And what it is, is how the company makes available to its employees its current openings. Uh, a good company, I think, should air those openings internally before they go look outside. It can be two weeks, it can be four weeks, it can be some period of time, but it demonstrates to the employees that, look, you're going to get the shot first. We want to look inside first because you're here. You're with us. And it shows, I think, trust and it shows some affiliation with the employees. However, here's the Machiavellian side for the business. Why wouldn't I want to hire somebody who already knows what we do, how we do it, has a track record of achievement in this company? Why would I reach out and hire somebody I've only known for three weeks? So there's a lot on the business side of putting up a good posting system, making sure it works correctly, and we can get into that whenever you like, but making sure that that job posting system, it facilitates the company, facilitates careers, and if I've got a rock star in my company, I don't want her leaving. I want her staying. And the only way I'm going to do that is to give her a career path. Because sooner or later, if she's a rock star, she's going to get the phone call, she's going to get the email of somebody trying to lure her out, because I do that as a living for recruiting. Right. I know how we find rock stars. I know how we lure them out. So why would I let that happen to someone who's been really great? I will promote their career. So it's usually called a posting system. At the higher levels, it's called succession planning. CEOs, C-suite, director levels. And it is something most boards of directors want to see. They want to know that they have what they call continuity in the business, which means they're not going to suddenly lose their chief financial officer and there's nobody there to take his place. Right. So, you know, when he or she leaves, you've got to make sure you've got somebody in the funnel. That's HR's job, is to make sure we don't come up empty on critical positions. Part of that is to have a good posting system. So employees should watch that. They should see what comes out. It should be completely visible and transparent in the company. And they should look at it and keep an eye open. And if they find something that they're um, interested in, then they need to understand the policy behind how the process works. Uh, every company will define how they use their posting system as well as putting it out there. So it's really an important piece to learn about it's almost as soon as you join a company, I think, and understand how that's going to work if you want to stay inside. So yeah. that would be the first piece. Yeah. Um, I'm, as you were speaking, I was thinking of a couple of challenging interview questions that come up for candidates, like how... How would it, um, or how would you suggest a candidate answer, you know, a question about like per se their weaknesses or gaps in employment history or um, changing jobs frequently? Like I, 
I've moved companies four times in the past couple of years, and um, all of it has been as a result of you know being offered a higher salary um, and, and and a better position, right? Climbing the corporate ladder, if you will. And so I'm curious. Um, you know, I have that come up a lot in conversation. Will candidates ask how? How would I answer this, or what do I what do I say in an interview when someone asks me about these things? Right. Well, uh, let me handle the weakness question because it's been around yeah. since I got out of grad school, back <laughs> when we barely had electricity. Right. Um, and it doesn't seem to be going away. And I think it's an ineffective, ill-used question. Tells you little or nothing about somebody, but it's out there. You're going to run into it. People still think it's meaningful. I tell you, it's not. My opinion. But they'll ask you that. So make sure when you answer that it's something developmental. It's something you're working on. It's something you want to take to the next level. Not, you know, I hate alarm clocks. Don't tell them that. Uh, do tell them that, you know, where I am is I've got my financial acumen at about this level. I'd like to take it here. And I'm hoping that this next move with your company can help me raise my financial acumen bar as well as the position I'm working in. So I'm hoping for some exposure to uh, seeing the company numbers and understanding how they work as well as my job in marketing. Mm -hmm. Make it developmental. Don't make it detrimental mm -hmm. is my two cents. Mm -hmm. uh, people used to say, you know, tell them about his strength anyway. No, that, they're going to, no, that, no, that's not the point. But you don't have to tell them that, you know, you have a craving for peanut butter every day. That's that they don't need to know that. Make it developmental. Apply it to the position you're in, and you can turn that question right around, and then ask them. Given that that's something I really like to do, do you think this position would offer me that opportunity? Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. of a sudden, you've changed the dynamic in the negotiation. You're asking the question. Watch how they respond to that. Some people respond to that with, "Oh my God, great." Other people are, "I'm in control." See what you get when you try and pivot the negotiation. It tells you a lot about this manager or this person as well as the company. Watch that interviewer's behavior, whoever they are. It'll tell you a great deal, not because of what they say sometimes, but because of how they act. Right. Read them carefully. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can uh, go on too much. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I'm, I'm curious. And, and as far as like gaps in employment history or yeah. changing jobs frequently, feel free to elaborate on those as well. I mean, please go on and on because these are these are tough questions. I think these are the ones that like stop people in their tracks in the yeah. interview process. And um, that's the last thing any candidate is going to want. You know, they want to be prepared. And I think to have um, the language and like to hear what other people um have responded or would want to hear, maybe from an internal perspective, I think can be really valuable. Yeah. Well, I think with gaps of employment, we really need to go back and look at those and be honest with ourselves, what happened. Because mm -hmm. that happens to a lot of women who leave the job market for family and then want to come back. You know, we call it off-roading and in-roading. And we just need to be honest about that. You know, uh, my partner and I talked about this. We decided that at this point, it would be best to try and get the, the kids off the ground for a couple of years. We did that. They're up and running. Uh, they're in preschool, whatever it is. And, you know, I spent my whole life up to that point getting ready for a professional career, and I'm ready to get back. And here's what I've done to prepare for that. That's right. the part a lot of people leave out. Mm -hmm. Here's what I've done to prepare. I've been reading. I've gone to seminars. I have, you know, upped my professional associations again. Reconnected with a lot of people in industry that I had connections with. In fact, I kept those going throughout this transition period. Transition period, not gap of employment. See the difference? This is a transition period. And um, and well, okay, tell me about it. And it just increases the the shot to get back in. On gaps of employment, we just need to be honest. Whatever caused that, don't know. There could be other things that got in the way. It could be an illness. It could be taking care of a sick parent. It could be lots of things. Mm -hmm. And I think we just need to be honest about that. Um, you know, I've always had, I've worked with a lot of attorneys because I've been in the head of HR role for a long time, and they always tell me the same thing, tell the truth. Yeah. And so I would say that you might, that may sound naive, but it's not. It's, mm -hmm. it's really not. So tell the truth. But move through it quickly. You don't want to make it a 30-minute story about the gap. You want to make it about a 30-second story, and you want to get back to what you want to do with your professional career and why you love their company. Move it. 
Mm -hmm. Move it and get back on track. Don't get bogged down in it. Um, first of all, it's none of their business beyond what kept you out. It's none of their business. You should have nothing to do with your capability. So move them back on track. Again, take control back in the interview, move it back on track, and start telling them why you're wonderful. And go from there. Yeah. Um, and so I also think one of the very valuable things that I've learned um, from taking your coursework was also like evaluating work culture, like especially in the interview process, like how, what, what are some things that, I mean, say somebody's coming into the job market, it's a brand new landscape, you know? So how am I as, as that individual weighing, um, you know, what are the elements that I need to be considering in terms of a positive work culture versus a toxic work culture? Like how do I spot those things? And I know we've talked a little bit about them you know, the, the response being a little bit controlling or, you know, those things are definitely indicators, but there's a lot to expand upon there, I, I think. And so I'm curious about um, what you would say are, are good indicators of, of um, you know, ways to determine whether a work culture is going to be the right fit. Sure, sure. Um, I'll keep it short because we go into this in class. We have a lot of fun with this in class when we talk about how to read a culture during an interview. Um, so first of all, you've got to do your own homework and decide what kind of culture you want. Not everybody wants a free-flowing, easy-going, we all take decisions culture. Some people like more structured, and that's all cool, it's, it's fine. But think about what you want before you start reading. So you, you've got your back pocket, here's the kind of place I'd like to work, now I'm going to start reading it. To read it, I call it the three P's, people, process, and place. Right. So every time you have an interaction with someone, you want to have that second camera running. The first camera is what are they saying, what, how are they responding? The second camera is how are they doing that? Do they make good eye contact? Do they call me by my first name? Have they tried to make me comfortable? Did we have a little bit of chit chat before we got into the, all the, the details of the job? Um, did they seem to want to listen to what I'm saying? And that's all in how you read people. So that's body posture, it is eye contact, it is um, just those pieces. The other good tell is, did they even read your resume? You'd be surprised how many people don't read or if you show up and they, they hardly know your background. Do you want to work for a company that didn't take, the manager didn't take 30 minutes to read a resume and understand and prepare for you as a candidate? So the people are the important piece. If you, and they mix with their, the, and the, the next piece is the process. So how did we go about getting to an offer, right? Did it start with a Zoom? Did it start with a phone call? Did it work its way through three or four phases? And how many of those is enough? It used to be that Google had seven levels of interviews, seven levels, before they'd make a decision. Um, what they found out through good HR science was three got the job done. More expeditious, fewer people said that's, that's too much for me, and they landed about the same caliber as candidates. So uh, you've got to decide on how much is enough in terms of go back, go back, go back. Second piece with that process is how long does this take? And what's the contact between the places? You have a great Zoom interview, you're excited about this company, you want to move things forward, you do the right thing, you send them a thank you email, and you get nothing. Two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, nothing. Are you still excited? I don't know. I'm not sure I would be. Okay. So why don't they keep the process moving? Uh, I will tell you that if they do get back to you after some lengthy time, you should ask about it. And you should phrase it you know, positively. I was really excited. Uh, had a great interview. I, I just I don't understand what happened. Let them tell you why there's a gap. And if they will tell you, cool. If they won't, that's something else on the side. So the process is important. Last but not least is if you have a place of where the interview occurs and it's not an airport, it's not a Starbucks, and, you know, but you actually go into a brick and mortar facility, read it. Walk in and take a look at the place. Are there any windows? We know that windows enhance productivity. Who meets you? How are you greeted? Who comes out to get you? Um, and where in the building do you have the interview? If they interview you in the cafeteria with all the people buzzing in and out and everything, that's one thing. If they take you into the manager's office, that's another thing. If they take you into an interview room, that's another thing. And how is that done? How is it read? 
if you get a chance to see the people in the workplace, how are they treating each other? Is everybody looking at their feet and nobody's saying anything? Or do you actually see people kind of talking and they're on a first name basis and they're talking about the ball game or they're talking about the play or they're talking about their kids? Whole different read. So people, process, place are the three things. Each of them can run deeper, but it's a good thing to kind of keep the three Ps in the back of your head about how do I read this place? Uh, but remember, you're comparing that what you are to what you already set up, which is what culture do you want? Right. What's important to you? Right. Um, this has all been just fantastic, and I hope that my listeners find it valuable. And um, for those of you who um, took Professor Quaid's class and were in my class, um, I hope that you learned some new things because um, I know that I did. And I'll I'll end with this question. Um, can you tell me about, uh, and I, I guess this is more like from your own experience as a professional, um, what was an, an ethical dilemma um, that you came across throughout the trajectory of your career? And um, can you talk a little bit about it and um, how you handled it? I think that that can be a, a really um, interesting question to ask people. And so I'm curious about, um, you know, I, I, ethics is such a big part of the hiring process. And so, yeah, I'm curious about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, I think it's naive to believe, I'm glad, I'm glad, I love the question, because I think it's naive to believe that you're not going to run into these situations. You are. Yeah. Especially if you're managing people and people and people, because most of the decisions we take are what I call gray decisions. It's not a, it's not a white, it's not a black, it's not an absolute. You've got to try and make the best choice you can with the data you have. And in industry, we always say, heck, if you've got 80% of the information, you're, you're in good shape. But uh, we talk about one of those in my class. I opened my HR class, where most people think all HR does is run payroll. And I tell them about the decision I had to make on whether or not I would hire a convicted murderer into our organization. And uh, it was a particular kind of company where we had to run multiple background checks. Uh, one of those was at the federal level. We love this candidate, uh, well-trained, great education, passion for the industry. Um, and when we ran this person's background check, it came in on a Thursday or a Friday, as I recall, he had been convicted of murdering his wife. This is a true yeah. story. Uh, second degree murder, so it wasn't planned, but still murder. Yeah. And we had to take a decision on, would we hire this person? Now, so to some of you, that may sound like, well, that's easy, no. To others of you, it would be, well, why wouldn't we give somebody a second chance? Right. And uh, more and more people are, are leaving prison and asking for that second chance, and I think we need to consider that hard and well about giving them that opportunity. However, in this case, we weren't talking about petty theft or stealing a car. We were talking about a convicted murderer. And so I spent the next few days talking to the CEO of the company, our general counsel, and really the decision came back to me is to make it yes or no. And so I tell that story in my first class of the semester, and I don't tell them what I did until the last class of the semester. So if they want the rest of the story, they have to put up with me for a whole semester. <laughs> and um, I won't tell the audience the decision I made either, but I will tell you that although that may sound extreme, you may run into sexual harassment situations, you may run into bullying, you may run into, they're out there, they're alive, they're still happening. You would think we'd go past it, but we're not. It's still going on. They're a little different flavor than they used to be. Bullying doesn't look just like it used to anymore, but it's still out there. And you're going to have to take a decision, even as an employee, what do I do about this? If it's you, who do I go to? If it's someone you know, do I report it? Those things go on all the time. And, you know, there's a difference between illegal and bad management. Right. Uh, you can be a terrible manager, just be terrible to everybody, and you're basically okay. Joking. But there are other things where they can't cross the line. Right. And that's where things where any type of harassment is going on, you really want to know that someone's going to investigate that. They're going to look into it internally. That there are appointed people who will ask the questions and look for witnesses and talk with people about what really happened there and look for patterns of behavior. In the most egregious case, people get fired over that, and they should. Uh, in other cases, people get disciplined, and hopefully they, either through better education or better oversight, those things don't recur. So you really want to take a hard look at those, but 
to your, to your opening question, Jennifer, we would be naive. We would be extremely naive, given that people are people, that you're not going to run into ethical situations. Mm -hmm. you, you are. You simply are. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, I just cannot say thank you enough. I really, um, it is always such a pleasure to have a conversation with you. And I um, just feel very humbled and honored that you would come on the podcast to talk about all these things that I think a lot of um, candidates are racking their brain over, you know, going into these interviews and, and throughout the whole process. So I just thank you so much for coming. Oh, that's quite all right. It's been, it's been my pleasure. And uh, <laughs> personally, great to reconnect with you again, Jennifer. Always enjoyed it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, for those of you who will be tuning in next week, please join me as I have Molly Roth of Molly Roth Counseling coming on to talk about the psychological impacts of poverty. And so that is going to be a conversation that um, you won't want to miss. And for those of you tuning in, I will see you next week.